Thank you. So Mind State Design Labs is founded on a single, simple first principle. Healing flows from the psychedelic experience. It's the acute subjective nature of the altered state of consciousness that drives treatment outcomes in mental health disorders. Of course, the experience and the biology both play a role. And there is this alternative approach of uh, attempting to edit out the hallucinogenic effects while preserving some of the therapeutic impact. But what grips us and inspires us and what is responsible for the transformational impact of psychedelics and the huge effect sizes in late stage clinical trials is the psychological event of the altered states of consciousness, the way in which various conscious states can each become a new realization, a new place to stand, a fundamentally new perspective that with proper integration provide insight and clarity and conviction. The landscape of these possible conscious states is unspeakably vast. William James, the father of American psychology, was perhaps the first person in modern times to speak to this immense range, this immense variety of conscious experience. Through his experiences with nitrous oxide and mescaline and his studies of the varieties of religious experience, he made this point, this, this famous quote, that this normal waking consciousness is but one special type of consciousness. We'll stall about it, parted from it by the filmiest of screens. There lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. Over the years, James' words have morphed into the pop science myth that we humans use only 10% of our brain. That's completely false, of course, but what is true is that this state of awareness we call normal waking consciousness is only a fraction of our experiential, our emotional, and our cognitive range. There are vast horizons of experience, richness, depth, textures of being human that open up in psychedelic states. The realm of experience uh, that we know is, is very small, and the realm of possible conscious experience goes far beyond the capacity of our imaginations. But specific compounds tend to place you in specific regions of that landscape of altered conscious states. I'm going to walk through a, a couple examples for the sake of illustration. So DMT, N-N-dimethyltryptamine. Uh, with DMT, this landscape metaphor becomes quite literal. The user is transported to a different place, a landscape, sometimes a room or some sort of alien technological landscape. And about 46% of the time, this landscape is apparently populated by entities, angels, elves, uh, aliens, some sort of intelligent entity. Uh, now, this occurs only 46% of the time, and the results in terms of the therapeutic experience tend to be a little bit different among different individuals. So some people come back and say, well, that was weird, but not particularly impactful. But uh, for others, the entities seem to speak some deep, unspoken truth that can immediately change the course of their life. In contrast, 5-MeO-DMT uh, very rarely, if ever, produces these types of entity, uh, entity interactions. Instead, the common 5-MeO experience is the classical introvertive mystical experience of oceanic boundlessness, something like an infinite expanse a unitive void, an immeasurably vast space in which all form and content dissolve, leaving only pure awareness, often in the great white light, also reported in near-death experiences. This unitive infinite experience is very common with 5-MeO, uh, as opposed to an NDMT, which we showed earlier, where ego dissolution features occur in only about 7% of cases. Uh, in studies with psilocybin, it has been shown that this uh, kind of unitive mystical experience is the primary predictive factor of long-term outcomes in treatment for uh, diseases such as depression. Both of those examples are beyond the veil, disconnected from the reality here and now. In contrast, 2CB uh, tends to not bring the user into any type of alternate reality or ego death. Uh, instead, it's this side of the veil. And the primary remarkable feature tends to be an increase in, uh, in sensory information. So colors are amplified. Physical sensations uh, as well are amplified. There are also some reports of prosocial or intactogenic effects. Finally, let's take the example of Ibogaine. Ibogaine induces a, a complex and varied experience. But one common theme that seems to continuously emerge is something like a waking dream where the individual is immersed in a sequence of memories presented as panoramic visual scenes. 
Some memories are mundane, others formative moments. Now, Ibogaine is one of these drugs where the physiology clearly plays an important role. The drug reduces opioid withdrawal symptoms and cravings, but patients also credit this intense experience of wrestling with and encountering these memories as central to their healing process. So with these examples, we see these distinct silos of experience. Each drug provides quite a wide range, uh, a, a wide uh, range of different experiences, and those ranges do overlap with each other, but not entirely. There are boundaries, and the boundaries certainly aren't black and white. So with NNDMT, not everyone sees entities. With 5-MeO, not everyone experiences ego loss, and so forth. But these kinds of experiences do show these consistent silos of experience. Our mission at Mind State Design Labs is to map the biological basis of these uh, great qualitative diversities of psychedelic experience, the different neural networks that correspond to these different aspects, these different qualia of the psychedelic state. The goal here is to pull out an individual instrument from the symphony of a psychedelic state, to select a single flower from the bouquet of these elements of perception, and the outcome here is to create therapeutics to, that, that send a patient to very specific regions of this landscape of altered conscious states. This mission directly addresses the central problem in psychedelic drug development, which is the lack of a translational animal model. If you accept that the subjective experience is central to treatment outcomes, you're faced with this fact that no animal can tell you much about the experience. Uh, assuming you are not under the influence of a psychedelic, the mouse is not going to talk to you. You can ha count tw head twitches, uh, you can uh, look at different behavioral models, but a mouse won't tell you, for example, which of the many varieties of ego loss a human is going to experience from a new drug or a, a new drug combo. Now, it's commonly known that psychedelic drugs, the different effects that, that happen with psychedelics, vary widely based on set and setting in individual physiology. So it's not all just different biology for different drugs. Set or mindset refers to personality, state of mind, uh, vulnerabilities, expectations, intentions. Setting refers to the physical environment as well as the social and the cultural environment in which the experience takes place. So psychedelics act as non-specific amplifiers. Whatever is on the mind at the time as a result of set and setting will often come to the forefront, be manifested. And, and so these things do play a, a very key role. Our challenge is to concretize the role that biology plays as opposed to these factors of set and setting. So one example of a feature, a particular psychedelic effect, aspect, or qualia that uh, tends to be associated with one particular drug is the appearance of jaguars with ayahuasca. Now this is one counterexample that shows something that is probably a set and setting mediated effect. So ayahuasca is commonly associated with the jungle. Many people who take ayahuasca are actually having the experience while they're in the jungle. So there are these factors of physical setting and cultural associations that are probably leading to this particular qualia coming up in the experience. But here's the thing, something as specific as a type of animal may actually sometimes be biologically based. So for example, high doses of the antihistamine diphenhydramine, uh, somewhere north of the 700 milligram range, are reported to consistently produce hallucinations of insects. Don't try this, by the way, it is reported to be horrifying. But this is one of these examples where, where it's actually probably the biology. There is no apparent connection to set and setting with the example of an insect. So our task here, our main challenge, is to differentiate between these two categories of experience, those which are likely mediated by set and setting, and those which are grounded in shared biology. So how do we do that? So Anne and Sasha Shulgin created hundreds of psychedelic drugs. Earlier I showed four examples of the most popular psychedelics, but because of Anne and Sasha, there have been these many drugs in use by various underground psychonauts uh, for many years. Uh, back uh, many decades ago, they, they would make these drugs, they would take the drugs, record the syntheses, record the experiential data, and they published that information in their books TCAL and PCAL, uh, published in the 1990s. So since that time, experience has been accumulating. People have been using these drugs. Uh, people have been reporting on the experiences of those drugs as well. And so what's resulted is a, a database of human experience. 
Uh, Anne Shulgin was one of the three original owners of Mind State Design Labs. She passed away this past July, but uh, we're proud to carry on as one very small part of the legacy that she and Sasha have left behind. So we are systematizing, scaling, and quantifying the Shulgin's process using that psychonaut data. We're also basing our research on the, uh, the research approach of our scientific founder, Dr. Tom Ray. Uh, so here I'm, I'm just going to shamelessly plug and brag about Tom a bit because his background is just so fascinating. Uh, the media has called him a candidate for uh, most interesting man in the world. He's one of these polymaths who has made seminal contributions to multiple areas of science. Uh, so he started college at 16. Before he'd even begun his PhD at Harvard, he was already publishing in the journal Science about new phenomena of nature he discovered with the natural history research method. He went on to the field of artificial life. With no background in computer science, he created a new CPU architecture, new operating system, new machine language, and created the first instance of evolution by natural selection after life on Earth, the world's first true artificial life program. And for the past two decades, he's focused his research on the naturalistic study of the phenomenology of psychedelic experience in humans, pouring over more than 8,000 sources of raw, unstructured testimonials, commonly known as trip reports. We've now expanded that database, identifying at a minimum 70,000 reports available from thousands of people across those hundreds of psychedelic drugs. Sasha and Dan Shulgin made this possible. They provided the tools. Uh, the psychonauts have provided the data, and so we want to take the next step. This is subjective human experience of altered states of consciousness. It's the solution to this central problem in psychedelic drug development of the inability to understand how biology relates to the human experience. So with this data, we're able to look at the different varieties of experience that these more exotic, uh, obscure drugs create in humans. Language is really the only useful medium of data we have for these experiences. And language is an amazing thing. These small mouth noises that carry information from my internal dictionary to yours. The edge of reality is the edge of language. It was Terence McKenna who said that words are tiles that we epoxy onto the face of this mystery we call reality. In some deep sense, we are language and the world is made of language. That's largely what separates us as a species. So the edge of reality is the edge of language. Many of these experiences are ineffable. It's very difficult to explain what's going on when your memory or your sense of self or your sense of time is functioning in a fundamentally different manner. Language mostly evolved within the scope of normal waking consciousness. And so these experiences are often ineffable. Ineffability is actually one of the major dimensions of the 11D ASC scale, uh, one of the primary scales used to characterize psychedelic effects in clinical trials. So what we've been doing is spending quite a bit on, uh, of effort on articulating the ineffable, extending the realm of what can be said. So we took Tom Ray's work. We also brought on board Josie Kins. Uh, Josie was the founder of psychonautwiki.org, effectindex.com, and some of the largest online psychonaut communities. She's devoted her life to looking at and documenting and concretizing and categorizing and defining all of these uh, different psychedelic effects in these, these various obscure molecules, um, taking the drug-induced ravings, the fantastic metaphors, and putting them into discernible, discrete categories that are defined and, and can be used. Again, extending the realm of what can be said. At this point, we have over 500 distinct aspects or qualia of the psychedelic experience. Uh, so to again uh, take the example of visual uh, uh, effects, these are just a number of the different definitions of the very specific types of visual effects that can happen with psychedelics. The 11D ASC, that validated rating scale, has two, whereas we have several dozen at this point. Uh, you can see it, it's at a, a much higher degree of resolution. Here are some replications as well, uh, some examples of these different types of visual effects that, that can occur. Again, these visual examples are not necessarily the most therapeutic examples. The therapeutic impact of psychedelics, rather than coming from the visuals, often comes from the, the affective domain, the emotion, 
or the fundamental constructs of perception, the sense of time, the memory function, the sense of self. But we've done the same for cognitive and emotional effects, dividing these into discrete categories that can map out the range of subjective experience. One way that we concretize and quantify this range of subjective psychedelic experience is by using natural language processing, or NLP. NLP uses computational linguistics, rule-based modeling of human language with machine learning, deep learning, and uh, statistical models. So all language exists within this multidimensional semantic space. And the space between language, between words, or between phrases, or between concepts, can be measured. It can be grouped into semantic vectors. And those vectors can actually be added or subtracted from each other. We can do math on language. So due to these recent advances in NLP, we now have a method by which to quantitatively represent all of psychedelic experience within that multidimensional semantic space. So having this map of the subjective human experience, we can then correlate that quantified representation of, of language, of experience, to the underlying biology. We're representing here affinity assays on those four psychedelic drugs that we discussed earlier. You can see that each of these drugs has a different profile of activation of different sites within the brain. Each of those sites, the receptors or, or other targets within the brain, can also differ in things like their functional selectivity, so the way in which the drug interacts with each particular target. The functional selectivity then leads to different types of downstream intracellular signaling events and other downstream interactions. But all of this complex biology ultimately results in the modulation of a particular neural network, uh, a particular pattern of activation within the brain. So this started with 35 psychedelic drugs assayed across 51 different receptors, transporters, and ion channels. We're now expanding that data set to uh, 106 sites and adding expanded functional assays uh, and other types of biochemical data. So what we're doing here is having a map of the biology to then put together with that quantified map of subjective human experience. There are a number of different methods of analysis to then put those two maps together. Uh, I'm going to go through two examples. Here is one. This is a uh, very high level, uh, very preliminary version of one of these analyses. And this particular uh, analysis was done by a lab at McGill University. They took 7,000 trip reports, all of the words from all of those trip reports, and they put them into that multidimensional semantic space. These two groups of factors here that you see in red and blue represent the poles at the largest window of variation within that space. So to, to visualize this, if you're thinking of, uh, say, collapsing that multidimensional space into a 3D model of the globe, the red group of words might be the North Pole, the blue group of words might be the South Pole. Uh, so the red group tends to correspond to things like physical qualia, uh, physical activities, visuals. The blue group of words tends to correspond to the more expansive spiritual concepts, consciousness, reality, the universe, things like that. So having found the, these two very separate spaces within the realm of psychedelic experience, we can then correlate those spaces to not only the underlying drugs, but the underlying receptors. So you can see here at the top right, uh, the 5-HT2A serotonin subtype is most highly correlated with that first semantic space, and the dopamine subtype D1 is most highly correlated with the second. This analysis can also be taken even to the level of brain regions. So using gene expression data, we can map out which areas of the brain are likely to correspond to these subjective features, these receptors, et cetera. So, Here's one more example. That was example number one. In this example, we're showing that this entire multidimensional semantic space can be mapped directly onto the human brain. So a group at UC Berkeley put people in an MRI scanner and uh, had the people listen to stories. As they were listening to the stories, the researchers mapped which areas of the brain were lighting up in response to the meaning, the semantics of each of the words. Uh, so they, they found that this was remarkably similar you know, across individuals. Different people had different semantics mapped to the same part of their brain. Uh, we also saw that the uh, the, the mapping here corresponded to the functionality that is already known about the brain. So words about visual descriptions, uh, for example, stripes, appear near the visual cortex. 
So this is another example of how we can take this, this uh, semantic representation, this quantified representation of subjective experience, and map it directly to the underlying biology. So those are two examples. There are many uh, examples of the analysis that can be done to put the two maps together of subjective experience and biology. But ultimately, it results in this quantitative representation that goes from a subjective effect to the associated drugs to the associated receptor or other biological target, and finally to the region of the brain. So it's this quantified representation that, that can go from subjective experience down to the underlying biology. And it allows us to then look at these correlations and look at what else we already know about the relevant target, the relevant receptor, and see whether engaging that target might have a role in modulating the nature of the psychedelic experience. So all of that analysis is for the purpose of prioritizing which drugs are then prioritized for progression to clinical trials. Um, so uh, we'll be looking at clinical trials next year, and we take this, uh, this combination molecule approach that we call the primer probe approach. Uh, the shamanic traditions often involve mixtures, and those mixtures themselves often have different molecules that interact with different targets in the brain. Uh, contemporary underground use is often polydrug. We're simply taking a, an approach with a, a new level of precision uh, according to certain biochemical insights. So we're developing a selective serotonergic agonist, a psychedelic, as a primer. That primer will then be combined one by one with a variety of other drugs that are not psychedelics, but that engage other sites within the brain that modulate the nature of the psychedelic experience. So the goal here is to be able to target which type of features are within the experience and turn up the volume up or down on those different features of experience. Uh, in the clinical trials, then, we also then have quantitative uh, validation of these correlations. So we start with the correlation of experience to biology, and then we have in the clinical trial statistical significance, validated rating scales that we'll construct based on that subjective effect index that we discussed earlier, um, and then neuroimaging that can turn these correlations of biology and experience into mechanistic insights about what's happening in the brain. So the result here is two things, both precision and range. So first of all, when, when we talk about precision, we're talking about modulating the specific nature of a psychedelic experience. Those different aspects, the qualia, the, the entities, the ego loss, the, the different things that can happen in the psychedelic experience. And I'm sure that many of us here today can recall a particularly profound psychedelic experience that we'd like to return to or be able to more reliably offer to others for their healing. Uh, and so that's the goal, having the, the precision to be able to do that. But precision is not necessarily the end game here. Uh, the real potential is in the ability to expand the range of human experience, to push the cutting edge of, of the human experience that we know. So I want to recall those original examples of DMT, versus 5-MeO, versus 2-CB, versus Ibogaine. The alien landscape populated by entities, the egoless infinite void, the sensory amplification on this side of the veil, uh, the panoramic memory replays. Now think about this. What are the yet undiscovered states of consciousness that are as profoundly different from those mind states as those states are from each other? We believe we've identified a few already specific replicable states of consciousness that are beyond the range of any of the single molecule existing legacy psychedelics. We see the potential to massively expand the bandwidth of human perception, creating entirely new sensoriums. It seems in this psychedelic space that uh, often the, the, the view, the underlying assumption, is that there exists maybe seven or so compounds that define the range of human experience. And the unspoken assumption is that all that's left to do is uh, do MedCam on those compounds to improve on the PK or to uh, reduce the cardiac risks. But the assumption is that the range of possible experience is already defined by, by what exists. But uh, the, the range of psychedelic experience isn't over. It has barely begun. So thank you. <laughs>